I'm uh, Eric. I lead demand generation at Rudderstack, but I started in customer success, actually, uh, which you heard in the jokes section. <laughs> Um, my background, I've done a lot of stuff in marketing and also have consulted in building tech stacks. Um, and I've done a lot of work with customer data as part of marketing. So that's me. Um, I'm Ryan. I have an engineering background, um, started in customer success as well. Um, came on as kind of our first technical hire on the US side and uh, have worn a bunch of hats. Uh, eventually ended up in the kind of pre-sales solution side. Um, and so I work primarily now with some of our strategic customers um, and strategic pros uh, prospects as well. So, uh, that's us. And what we're gonna talk about today, so Ryan and I have been at Rudderstack for almost two years now. And, you know, of course, we both have like different KPIs now, like on the marketing side, um, Ryan's on the solution side. But when we started, we both uh, had a charter to basically own our internal implementation of our own product, which we kind of called dog food. Um, and interestingly, even though we sort of split off to different teams, we actually still do this today. So we still lead uh, the implementation and usage of our own product in our company, which is pretty fun. Um, so we're sort of like the de facto team of like internal customer me, uh, who's sort of defining requirements, uh, and Ryan uh, as a developer who's acting as the data engineer. Um, so we still do this work, and uh, all these pipelines run all of the data for like key teams across the entire company. So what we're going to talk about today is the journey of where we started, um, and then show you kind of where we are today, and then where we're going. Um, and this is a this is a um, you know, a small group, so like, feel free to jump in and interrupt and uh, ask questions. Um, we'd love to answer any questions. So, let's look at where we started. We call this the pre-seed scrappy stack. Um, so, when, when Ryan and I started, the really, like, the company was a handful of people, all engineers, basically. And so, um, all engineers and then one salesperson, so they set up the most basic stack you could possibly set up. Um, so, was, you know, Google Tag Manager, you know, sort of as a, you know, pulling in third-party scripts on the website, running integrations, etc. Um, they had Mailchimp wired up to Salesforce to create leads, which was really brittle and a huge mess. <laughs> <laughs> a dark point for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ryan was like, oh no. Um, Next panel was also running. Um, you know, for sort of the like uh, more like user level behavioral data. And we were actually running router stack instrumentation on the website and app and dumping all that raw data to S3. But, um, you know, pre seed, you don't actually really have any data, right? I mean, you have a couple of users in the app and, you know, a couple hundred visits on the website. And, um, you know, so you don't really have analytics. And, um, this was tough. Ryan, you want to talk a little bit about the pain here? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, first of all, it was just hard to figure out what was going on, what was happening where. Like I said, it was a dark moment when I realized, like, we're populating Salesforce via MailChimp. Why? Uh, it was because, you know, the sales guy was the one that set that up. And so really we had to, like, step back and figure out, you know, okay, if we get rid of MailChimp or if we change using MailChimp, or how do we get leads into Salesforce? And really just trying to figure out what was doing what. There's a lot of, as you can see, manual processes where we're scrubbing leads you know, updating bad data once it's in Salesforce so that we can actually see, um, you know, who's there. And then every time one of our engineers signs up for the app to test something, we're creating a lead in Salesforce. So it's just all just a, a giant nightmare. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was kind of what uh, was the impetus for us getting to work. So um, this is, so we started to say, okay, we're gonna redo our stack. Um, so, like Ryan said, updates to marketing infrastructure like forms or anything like that was hugely painful. Um, you know, Tag Manager is its own subject, which is like a huge mess and nightmare in and of itself. We had really inconsistent data because we had instrumentation in Google Analytics, mixed panel, et cetera. Um, the other thing was, from a tooling perspective, MailChimp was way too primitive for sort of behavioral-based email campaigns, um, right? When you're talking about like tons of custom fields and their, you know, fields have uh, limits uh, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then also our reporting needs started to outstrip uh, the ability of, or, or started to outstrip the ability of the point solutions analytics tools to solve those problems. So one example here actually 
um, that's really interesting, I think a lot of companies run into is the MQL definition that the company agreed upon had both um, required data both from Salesforce, right, which was a manual flag at that point that someone like checked a box in Salesforce, you know, because there was like you know, SDR scrubbing lead. What is MQL? Uh, marketing qualified lead. Okay. Yeah, so it was like, you know, leads come in, someone signs up for the app, and then the lead goes into Salesforce, and we had someone on the sales team scrubbing the lead, you know, going and looking on LinkedIn, how many employees, all that sort of stuff, looking at the demographic information, setting a flag in Salesforce and said, okay, this is a marketing qualified lead. But then it was also behavioral, right? Like if someone signed up for a webinar, that wasn't like really high intent to buy as opposed to someone requesting a demo. And so this is a really common thing. Like it's very difficult to use both behavioral data and then data that's flagged in some sort of cloud tool um, to have like a single definition, right? And so doing that in like a point analytics tool like Google Analytics or Mixed Analytics or whatever is like pretty challenging. You know, or you try to get the behavioral data into Salesforce, which is even worse. Um, so this is kind of the pain we were feeling. So I took sort of these problems um, as a set of requirements and went to Ryan and said, okay, let's clean all of this up, um, you know, and sort of stop the bleeding of this pain of integrations. And this is what Ryan uh, built. Yeah, so this was, um, this was kind of our first step. And so this was uh, fun for me to actually get to uh, build a stack, as you can imagine, coming into um, a data company and seeing uh, what we were doing before <laughs> was upsetting. And so uh, getting to do some actual uh, work using our own product was really valuable as well, as I was on, um, you know, working with customers pretty heavily at the time. And so what we've got here, um, just for clarity's sake, the, the little rudder stack logo there is, um, is basically acting as our rudder stack service. That's all the data that we're collecting from the front end of our website, from the back end of our website. Um, and then Where we install SDKs, right? So JavaScript SDK on the front end, like Node and Go SDKs on the back end, and all of that behavioral data and user data is, is flowing through our system. Yep, and so we've been able to completely, at this point, get rid of the Google Tag Manager solution. Um, I've been able to, and at this point, uh, you know, I'm not in the Rudder Stack dashboard at all here. It's giving me a right key that I need to initialize the SDK with, and then he's setting up these destinations and kind of giving me that, me that spec from before. And so I'm able to, um, go into the code level, instrument those events um, kind of once and for all, and then begin to pipe that data through Rudder Stack. And so the, the cool thing there is that there's a lot of side benefits, like, right, like we got to centralize our stack, we got to actually start using our product and, and kind of you know, use it as intended, but we also um, had a lot of site speed and SEO optimizations because we're not carrying all of the, just everything under the sun shoved into Google Tag Manager um, that's, that's hurting the performance of our website. And so, um, the other thing this allowed us to do is we kind of own the tracking plan at this point. No one's playing around in Tag Manager, adding new triggers, adding new integrations. Um, it's only the events that I've instrumented on the front end and the back end, and nothing else is going through our data stack. And so um, one of the things that we're also able to do as part of this, as you can see, uh, we kind of have modified our stack at the same time because instrumenting all those events one time uh, with the Rudder Stack SDK, it's now pretty trivial to just add Snowflake as a destination. So now we have data warehouse connected um, as Eric mentioned, you know, um, MailChimp was a little primitive for our growing needs. And so, you know, wired up MailChimp and immediately subbed it out for customer IO. And again, no additional engineering work. We haven't touched any more of the, the front end instrumentation, the back end instrumentation. That's all just kind of, um, kind of set and forget at that point. So, um, this also kind of we added, we pulled Salesforce data in the structured data so that we could use Snowflake to basically do a couple simple joins and produce the MQL number, right? Um, which was difficult to do in other tools. So we had the behavioral data in there flowing from the websites and apps, and then we were pulling the structured data in from Salesforce that had that MQL flag that the salesperson was you know, checking. Um, and it was really easy with a couple joins uh, in Snowflake to get an accurate number um, you know, for reporting. Yeah, so the kind of net result here is we've eliminated you know, a ton of dependencies, a ton of network calls from our website, um, we know what data we're collecting at this point because it's only events we've instrumented, and um, I don't have to worry about the integrations anymore or what they do. Eric's managing those in the dashboard. I'm not, you, I'm not using a mixed panel or Salesforce or Google Analytics SDK. Those are all being handled through other stack. I don't care what those payloads look like. Everything's just kind of a unified event structure. Um, and so, at this point, we're in a pretty good spot, right? We feel uh, like we kind of pat ourselves on the back until Eric has some issues for me. So that was great. Like, website's working, 
we're getting the raw data feed of behavioral events coming through, um, which is really nice, but of course the business starts to get more complex like as they do as they grow. So data was really accurate across all those destinations because we only had one source of data, which was the router stack SDKs feeding that data into all of these downstream tools, right? The integrations work was gone, and so we have you know, sort of complete accuracy across systems. Now, when you start to have accuracy across your systems, people start using data more, and the more you use data, uh, the more you want to answer like different types of questions and do more interesting things with data. So the things that came up at this point were, so sales wanted third-party enrichment um, of the leads, right? So they're like, well, it'd be great to use like Clearbit, and then we wouldn't have to go manually scrub all these leads and LinkedIn and all that sort of stuff, right? Well, the Clearbit plugin for Salesforce at us, you know, this was sort of, I think, post-seed stage, right? But it was still really, really expensive, right? But they're like, it would be great to not have to manually scrub the leads, right? They were also, which I know this is a huge surprise, sales was changing the values in the lead source field. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and we're you know, sending these payloads through Rudderstack when someone fills out a form for request demo or whatever. You know, so that caused problems. As Ryan said, marketing on the marketing side, we really needed to filter out emails, right? Internal emails, you know, for people, you know, our engineers who were signing up for the app to test things, even locally, right? Like all the SDKs were running in there. Um, and then we also needed data from the email platform and Snowflake because we wanted to stitch the customer journey together, right? So we had all the behavioral events going through, which is great, but now we're starting to send people email and we wanted to see like, okay, are they, is the email actually like moving the needle? And again, like you can't do that in an analytics tool, you have to do that in the warehouse. Product decided they wanted to use Amplitude for product analytics, even though we already had a mixed panel instance, but it's like, okay, well, they, you know, <laughs> you're a team lead and it's your budget, you can use that. And at this point, you know, the company was growing a little bit, so we started having people sign up that were like exciting logos, and so everyone wanted the notifications in Slack. So, you know, I spent you know weeks, months, sort of collecting this spec, and then went back to Ryan and said, "Hey, like, here's here's what we need to do as the next phase of this." Yeah, and so this was fun for me because this was much less of like a daunting task of like going in and untangling a bunch of someone else's work. This was working on an existing pipeline that we had implemented, you know, according to best practices. Um, and so it was much more approachable, much more uh, exciting to get to work on. So um, a couple things that have changed at this point of our journey. Um, you can see just initially, you know, Google Analytics is moving to GA4, and so that was an easy just integration to sub out for us. We didn't have to do any instrumentation around that. We just subbed it out on the RudderStack side. I didn't even know that happened. Eric did that, because um, again, I'm not really in the, the RudderStack dashboard at all. So at this point, um, everything I'm doing is either uh, instrumenting events, which largely is done, I'm not really touching that, but these transformations you'll see, so anywhere there's a like green dot with a RudderStack logo calling out, that's a custom transformation that happens within RudderStack. So as that data is flowing through RudderStack, in real time we can run any JavaScript function we like on it to um, do some of this cleanup where there's remapping the fields that you see here, or whitelisting traits, or even reaching out to Clearbit uh, inline, getting some of this company data adding that to the event in flight, and so it, when it lands in Salesforce, it already has, as you can see, the you know, industry category, company size, employees, um, all that stuff. So, um, again, I'm doing, and, and these transformations, I'm managing all from my code editor and pushing via API. So literally never going into the Rudder Tech uh, user interface. I have no idea what Eric's doing in there. Um, we also were able to add Slack as an integration um, and just filter essentially those leads that are coming in and just let everybody in the company kind of see who's signing up for the app. And then, um, we have amplitude in there now as well. So there's some dotted lines. What we're kind of noting there is that one of the things that we mentioned uh, earlier, and we didn't, we're not really showing this, just to kind of eliminate some complexity, but we're dumping all of the data that we get uh, into S3. So we have just this dump of raw data. And so when we decided we wanted to use amplitude, it's as simple as adding it in the UI. We're now piping data to amplitude, but it's not that valuable if we don't have previous data. So we were able to backfill six months um, by piping that data from S3 to rudder stacker through Rudder Stack to Amplitude, and essentially we have now an Amplitude instance that's at parity with what we're looking at in mixed panel or um, other downstream destinations. Um, and so then, you know, just to call out as well, these two transformations, there's just kind of some screenshots on here. This first one, again, is, is me living outside of the Rudder Stack infrastructure, um, just pushing this transformation that has a mapping to these fields. So kind of what I mentioned, that sales is, is changing lead sources or um, we want to track forms via a single event, right? So I've already instrumented a form fill event, forms event, 
um, on the front end, instead of having to go in and modify that every time we want to add a new form or add a new submission, um, we just have the form ID and the payload. And so what this allows us to do is Eric can go in, um, this is a mapping that I've pushed via API, but Eric can go into the UI and easily, when he adds a new form, add just the ID of the form, and then what he wants my transformation to map the title of that to. So that, um, let's for example, in Salesforce, we don't want someone's lead source to show up as wf-form-cta page dash, you know, yada, 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 it just comes in as request demo. Um, and so again, this is all managed in flight. We're not having to go back to instrument events. We're not having to go through dev cycles to ship stuff to our um, to our app or our website. And then this is the, the clear bit that I mentioned uh, down below. And so those are, those are uh, again, denoted on the pipeline. And then we're also, another thing you'll see we've added is we're piping that Salesforce and customer IO data in via ETL so that we can get that um, kind of user journey data into the warehouse. Um, and we're kind of, this was kind of jumping ahead, we kind of found ourselves going back to Snowflake as our source of truth a lot. We're like, hey, why is this lead marked as you know a different lead source in Salesforce? Or why is this you know user activity being reported differently in Amplitude versus Mixpanel? And so, this, so the dump at Snowflake is always just a place we can go and see, oh, okay, these events were fired in the wrong order, or this event was improperly tagged. We can go back and fix that via transformation. Um, so that's gonna kind of lead into um, the, kind of the next step of our journey. But um, this was all pretty cool. Like this is all, again, I'm managing it the way I want to in my code editor. Um, Eric's doing what he needs to in the dashboard. We're really not getting each other's way. And again, we're, we still have other jobs outside of this. This is just kind of an, an internal um, initiative that we have. So um, yeah, so we felt pretty smart at this point. We did feel pretty smart. <laughs> um, cool. So <clears throat> at this point, uh, we had some of the foundation that we needed to do what we called like getting fancy, especially because we had like all this behavioral data in the warehouse, okay? Um, and the email data as well was a huge part of that. So one of the big things here was uh, we actually started to calculate like a very basic lead score, right? Just one out of five. That was a indicator of someone's sort of likelihood um, to do like a high intent conversion. Okay, right? And I mean, at this point we have, you know, sort of five or six conversion points. Like it's, it's sort of like um, really, really basic, right? Um, but, you know, we had some really smart engineers who like built a really basic model uh, and calculated this lead score. We started testing it. We realized like, wow, this is actually pretty accurate and really helpful, right? The challenge was it, that lead score lived in the warehouse, right? Because they're calculating it, you know, on whatever their sort of basic like ML infrastructure is and then pushing that back uh, into Snowflake, our warehouse. The other challenge we had, which was really interesting, was uh, domain rank, um, which is like the a number of emails associated with a particular account for someone like signing up for Rudderstack, and then they invite like four teammates, right? Well, those are all distinct leads, technically, because they're separate people but they're part of one single account, right? And that made things challenging, right? So like marketing automation was challenging because, okay, well you have like someone signed up for the app, but then they invite three people, like do they all need to get the exact same email? Like are they doing different things in the app, right? That becomes challenging. And then also it impacted things like MQL counts, right? It was like, okay, well if six people sign up for the same app and that company is qualified, um, they meet the criteria, right? So marketing's like, great, like our MQL number looks awesome. But in reality, like in terms of like a customer that's eventually going to convert, it's actually just one, right? Um, so we, we started to look at domain rank, right? Which order did this person come in? Were they the very first person? You know, were they like a subsequent, you know, invite to the account or whatever? Also, it was great to have all the data in the warehouse, but we had reporting queries spread everywhere, right? So we had some stuff on Snowflake, we had some stuff in LookML, blah, 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 which was a huge pain. Um, and then we started to experience problems with API limits, right? So volume's growing, we're sending a bunch of data, multiple people are signing up, and so there were some instances where actually we, because Rudderstack was recording these behavioral events, we would see these leads come through and then it would ping the Slack channel and be like, ooh, that's a great logo. And then the salesperson would be like, this person isn't in Salesforce, like what happened, right? And so we're like, well, what did happen? So we were like, we have the data in Snowflake and we could see all of that on the marketing side. Um, but, the, but what was happening actually was 
um, we had uh, we had hit Salesforce's API limit. We were literally sending data to Salesforce too fast, right? And so if two leads basically hit Salesforce uh, simultaneously, it couldn't process them both quickly enough, and it would drop one. Um, now, thankfully, we were running router sockets, so we had the original payloads, and we could do all that in the warehouse, right? But the sales team, you know, obviously, like that was a really fun period of like constant <laughs> Slack messages, of, like. I see the lead in Slack, but it's not in Salesforce. What's going on? So I went back to Ryan and was like, okay, like, you know, we're not dealing with like the pain of all this direct like integration and instrumentation, but like marketing's complaining about analytics stuff and domain rank, you know, sales team is complaining all over Slack because the leads aren't getting in there, all that sort of stuff. So this is what Ryan did next. So this is the next iteration of our stacks. We, we refer to this as our um Typically in this journey, we would say machine learning stack. But this was more of like a baby machine learning stack. So we're kind of just introducing ourselves to this. And so at this point, we've built a pretty robust pipeline um, that's really kind of set up to run a lot of, as we mentioned in the, the initial slide, like a, a lot of our business functions, like revenue ops, sales, uh, marketing, everyone's kind of got the data that they want living somewhere. And so this was really the step where we kind of combined that all to where we think it should live. And so. Um, the, the really only changes you'll see here are, um, we kind of took this as a moment to, okay, we're doing all of this uh, look ML and SQL and you know, some DBT on the data that we have in Snowflake, that's what we trust, we're doing some, some modeling, we have our master user record there, and so we really decided to centralize that around DBT um, and some of the machine learning stuff we're doing, um, as you can see with SageMaker and some Jupyter Notebooks. And so that's all managed um, where the analytics team wants to be. So they're not having to do any of the engineering work, they just get to live in DBT, um, and SageMaker and operate on that data and provide the models that we need. And then we actually, one of the pipelines that we have at Rudderstack is the reverse ETL functionality. And so all that that modeling, that data that we want to, that we've been, that Eric kind of mentioned, we've been modeling and building and then just manually kind of going in and uh, sales people drooling over and then trying to get into Salesforce, we can now pipe that automatically in on a, a nightly job. So um, middle of the night, every night, we run a bunch of DBT models. Uh, we do some lead scoring, we do some domain rank, um, a number of things. Um, and basically, those are automatically then piped back through our stack and then populated in Salesforce. Um, we you know, do that in Richmond and Snowflake as well, and then customer IO. So this really gives us kind of an end-to-end -end look at these customers. One of the other things that I'll point out we did is the Salesforce transformation moved um, places from before Salesforce to after, kind of around some API limitations and race conditions. Um, as we were growing, we, we really wanted to focus on making sure that we were capturing all these leads. Um, because of the, you know, the issue where they're maybe in Slack but not Salesforce. And so we really wanted the Salesforce lead creation process to be as simple and clean as possible. So as soon as that person signs up, we create them in Salesforce with nothing more than their name and email, just to avoid any issues with custom fields or any collisions or anything. Salesforce fires off a webhook that says a new lead was created, and so we actually send that webhook back through Rudderstack, and that's what we use for enrichment now. So we're generating a lead immediately, we're sending a webhook, and so within a couple seconds, that webhook goes back through our stack, hits the clear bit transformation, gets us all that um, company data that we're that we're looking for, and populates that, that back in Salesforce. So there's a bit of a lag there, but it's not really noticeable unless you're to be looking at the lead while it happens. Um, but it's much more robust for us. Um, and then again, we're, we're able to populate that into the downstream tools. Um, and again, this is something that, that I've been able to do with, again, without having to touch any of these integrations, without having to go to the rotor stack dashboard at all. This is all stuff that I'm really living in my code editor, managing these transformations, tell, telling Eric, Eric which mappings he needs to manage, and then spending some time with our analytics team in DBT um, and SageMaker, and really, Rudderstack's just kind of taking care of the pipeline stuff by itself, and so I'm able to um, work with engineering on the engineering side, and then work with analytics on making sure they have the data they need to build up through that modeling, and get that stuff back into the downstream tools uh, where the team needs. So, this is pretty great. This is um, this is kind of like our, our full pipeline that we that we run a lot of our business functions off of today, um, and, and feeds a lot of our other data products. There are there are another a lot of other pipelines that we're not showing here. This is kind of the one I'm going to walk through because it was the one where we, we kind of have done the most iterations on. So um, so that's kind of the, the ML stack. So at this point, I'm happy, right? Because the marketing team now has like domain rank and lead score every morning, so that you know, let's say someone hits like a like a lead score of five, right? Which means it's like a really, really hot lead. Well, we can filter all of those people out of like the marketing drip email that's trying to get them to like you know become more qualified or take some sort of action. Um, it also helps the sales team like prioritize leads, all that sort of stuff, which is great. All that stuff's coming in every morning, and so like everyone gets to work and 
you know, everything's just running like all the day where we need to have it, uh, which is great. So I was telling Ryan, I was like, hey, I think we're done. Like, <laughs> I mean, I know something's gonna change at some point, like, you know, because it's happened three or four times, you know, over the last two years. But I was like, I feel like we can just run this, like, you know, for a while, and like, we're probably just pretty good, right? Because if another team wants to come use a tool, right? So it's like customer su success says like, hey, we want to use Zendesk, right? Well, we can literally just go into Rudderstack and add Zendesk as a destination, and it will get all the flow of events, like create the users, do all that sort of stuff. The reverse ETL will push like the domain rank, the lead score, like all that sort of stuff into Zendesk, right? So it's super flexible and super easy. So I was talking to Ryan about this, and Ryan was like, yeah, I don't disagree with you, but what if you could do some of those things you're doing literally in real time? Right? Like, what if you didn't have to wait for a nightly job um, to get domain rank? Right? You could literally instantly have that in all the downstream tools. And I was like, well, that's pretty heavy handed for where we're at. You know, it's like a you know, Series B, um, you know, B2B SaaS company. But I was like, but I'll take it. Like, if we can do that. Um, and so Ryan started, and Ryan brought this up because he had seen several of our customers build this architecture that essentially sort of enables like real-time access to sort of ML use case data, uh, which is really cool. So for us, it was like, well, I mean, again, like we don't necessarily need this, but like if we could get domain rank on the fly, like right when a lead is created, like that would be pretty cool. Cause then, you know, we don't have to build delays into marketing automation. We literally just know if this person's like the very first person who signed up or if they were like invited to an account or whatever. Um, so real-time updates on those things and lead score, uh, would be cool, and then also like obviously Ryan and I are kind of nerdy, and so I was like, I mean, we can do this. So we haven't quite gotten there, but this is what we're going to work on building next. Yeah. So the the cool so uh, one big caveat and kind of air vision. This is this is much more of a common application for like a, a B two C type application where we see this a lot with our e commerce customers, for example, where they're going to use they use this stack that I'm going to describe a little bit here um, for like what Eric said earlier, for, like real-time recommendation engines or personalization, um, or even you know, search results where they're, they're wanting to do some ML modeling uh, in real-time on search results um, and cross-selling capabilities. So just, just take that caveat that, again, this is heavy-handed, but um, the cool thing is, because I'm not maintaining any of these pipelines, because Rudderstack's handling all of the infrastructure, um, we actually, you know, even, if, even with this not being my primary role, I have the margin to finally get ahead of this, right? So like everything else has been like catching up with teams you know complaining about things and having to fix pipelines and now we're at a point where like this is really running pretty well and I'm not maintaining anything and so with some of that margin I have I can actually you know prepare for something that might make more sense down the road and can kind of get us ahead for once it's really cool that you know without even actually having a data engineering team we actually kind of have the margin now to get ahead of this stuff and so um, the only thing that's really changed in this diagram is that we're piping all of this data uh, again, to all these various destinations in real time, but we've now added Redis as a destination. And so, um, if you're not familiar, Redis is just a you know um, just low latency key value store, um, and so that gives us access to push this data into it immediately. We're basically creating a user profile for every user that comes to our our application. And so, on the fly, we're just creating that that record, um, and then we're using some of this modeling that we're doing in Snowflake to batch more um, behavioral data or domain rank or ML models back through Rudderstack to enrich that Redis profile. And so one example would be um, using Eric and I as an example. Let's say I'm a data engineer. I've been, uh, we, you know, we, I exist as a user profile. Uh, I've signed up for Rudderstack. I've actually created some sources of destinations. I've been active in the UI. We're able to see that I've also, you know, watched a couple webinars, read some technical documentation. And so I um, have a high intent, uh, but I'm a data engineer, so I'm probably not the purchaser of Rudderstack. And so, um, but we've got this model that we've been able to build around my activity in this Redis cache. And so then let's say Eric comes and signs up for the app, right? And so Eric signs up as head of growth marketing. So that Eric's the person that's actually gonna make the decision and write the check and purchase Rudderstack. And so it, it, in a typical flow, Eric would come in, we'd have to wait for all this enrichment and realize that, oh, hey, Eric you know, is a new lead, but actually Ryan, his data engineer, has been very active. And so there's a lot of intent here. Ryan's probably told Eric, like, hey, we need to go buy this thing. And so Eric's checking it out for the first time. And so what this allows us to do is as immediately as Eric signs up for the app, that Redis cache is going to have the domain rank associated with me, where we're going to be able to, in, in a transformation in real time, connect and say, hey, this is um, someone that fits the profile of, of, a, of a buyer. 
and they have a you know associated data engineer with their domain who's done a lot of work in the product already. This is a this is a super uh, high intent lead, and also someone we probably need to reach out to and kind of prioritize that. And so we're feeding all that to Redis, and then we're basically setting up a Lambda API gateway in front of it so that we can access that directly from those transformations where I mentioned earlier where we're doing the clear bit um, enrichment. We can now do that um, in real time and have you know super fast access to all that. And so. The way this would kind of manifest in the B2C is, is that same piece as I mentioned would be these Redis caches and then we would be you know, doing some modeling, sending that in. And then this could be done, and it, uh, we have a lot of customers that are doing it basically, whether it's an API gateway or something like a GraphQL server in front of it, where they're actually accessing that Redis queue from the, um, from the client side, from the front end. You know, so they're, they're doing this you know, in real time as a customer is going through checkout steps or um, browsing different products on the website, they're able to pump some of that modeling into Redis and then provide that as real-time personalization. So um, again, a little heavy-handed, but um, you know, pretty exciting to get to work on and, and get to get ahead of. And again, you know, at this point, there's still just two of us managing this entire pipeline. It's neither of our you know, KPI, and so um, kind of you know, allows us to uh, not have the data engineering team to do this and have people that are pretty close to the process and the product um, working on it. So um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of the overall pipeline. So again, and I'll let Eric speak a little more to the marketing stuff, but um, from the data engineering side, the, the really cool thing that it allows us to do, and you know, I say it's just me and Eric, we do have um, someone on our analytics team that we brought in and does a lot of modeling, um, but even still, you know, this is not his primary KPI either, but what it allows us to do is, again, I'm not, I'm not maintaining any pipelines, I'm not you know, doing any infrastructure maintenance. I get to kind of gravitate towards where my skill set or my interest is, right? So like, Getting to you know do set up this Redis and per, uh, real time uh, situation is something that is intriguing to me, and I have the margin to do it, so I'm able to do that now. Whereas Benji, the other one that's helping us out, you know, he's um, he fits like a different data. I mean, data engineering is kind of a loaded term, like what a data engineer actually do. So Benji would fit a data engineering uh, profile as well, but very different than me. Where I'm on the you know product engineering side, formerly, he's much more um, you know heads down SQL, DBT, modeling type stuff, and so for him to not have to like fight his way through the engineering side, he can really just focus all of his time that he has to do this on actual modeling. And then I can focus on the, the engineering side that I enjoy more. Um, so it really allows us to better utilize our internal tool, our internal resources, you know, human resources, uh, to do what we're best at, what we enjoy working on the most. And then from a marketing side. No more angry Slack messages, <laughs> um, you know, from people who are have questions. Not about the pipeline. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no more angry Slack messages about data pipelines or you know lack of data. Um, no, it's great. I mean, really, um, I think the way that a lot of, uh, or the pain that I think a lot of companies feel feel in trying to respond to the needs of the business as it relates to data, is they start on a path of like very heavy customization, right? That's why every Salesforce instance is like a major Frankenstein because you're trying to bend it over backwards to get it to do all of these crazy things that it was never intended to do to deal with things that are like actually pretty simple, like domain rent, right, or MQL definition. Um, and so it's really, really nice to be able to solve, solve all of that at the data layer in the warehouse and then syndicate those solutions back out to the stack. Um, uh, and it's just real, and it's so flexible too, right? Like we're talking about a DBT model that produces a table. And so if we need to change something, it's very, very easy to change that, like very, very easy. Right, uh, and the like the ops teams, you know, that work in these tools and everything, they love it as well, right? Um, and again, like Benji, um, the person who works on the analytics stuff, if we need to change like a field or you know all the stuff that happens in a growing business, like you just do that in the DBT model um, and make sure that the downstream tools can receive it, and then literally the next morning, the entire you know stack gets updated with this system-wide change um, that's happening in a single table. Uh, in the warehouse. So I also am very excited to like literally get a lead score live in the payload immediately after someone signs up, especially like for domain rank two. You know, like Ryan is saying, it's it'd be amazing to know, okay, this person gets invited to the app, they sign up, we hit the Redis cache and we know, oh wow, the first person who signed up is a data engineer who has a lead score of five, right? Wow, okay, this account is hot. You know, this is that needs to change like the emails that we send from the marketing prioritize it on the sales team and everything. So it'll be really fun to get that. And it's fine now, but um, you know, it would be cool to see sort of that fun in real time. So that is, uh, that's where we're headed, uh, and that's kind of the journey we went on. So um, we'd love to answer any questions.
or hear any thoughts. Not everyone at once. Why do you choose Snowflake instead of any of the other outdated web apps? Do you know the answer to that? I know the answer. You do? Yeah. They're the first one that responded to our partnership email, apparently. Ah. <laughs> so. Well, actually, the dirty secret is that um, there, there's two things. That, that is interesting. Yeah, because we integrate with all the major warehouses, but like the dirty secret is we actually do send data to other warehouses as well. So we do actually send data to Redshift and BigQuery as well. Um, and Benji, we mentioned, the analyst on our team, he actually prefers Google uh, Data Studio. And so he has a couple of models. And again, this is like something that he's able to do without us even really. I didn't know about it until recently because he's able to do all this on his own as part of the pipelines. But he's sending some of the data to a Google Sheets from the warehouse, from Snowflake. Yes, he does. So, yeah. that, he can, so that he can visualize it in Google Data Studio because that's yeah. what he wants to do. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're uh, I guess, mocking out uh, BigQuery. Yeah, that is funny. <laughs> Benji has said, though, and I agree, like just using Snowflake is nicer. Like It's just a nicer tool. Uh, it's kind of like an Apple product, I guess. I don't know. It's just like nicer to use. It's, it's like very ergonomic. but. That is really crazy. So we realized, so Benji was building some reports and he sent them to us in Google Data Studio and we were like, how are you like doing this? You know, like we have other BI tools. But he was in like a prototyping phase. So he literally took tables um, from Snowflake and pushed them via reverse ETL into Google Sheets, like with sample data, or like a subset of the data, um, laid Google Data Studio on top of that, did all of the modeling because he's just really well versed in like Google Data Studio and like report building there. And then we like tinkered with report for weeks and like got it right. And literally it was just an underlying table in Snowflake. And so then when the report was ready for like, you know, to share with the entire team and like the execs and whatever, uh, we literally just like laid Tableau on top of the table that he was working on, um, you know, in, in Snowflake and like, the visualization was, there was no visualization work beyond like, it was just like replicate what was in Data Studio, um, which was amazing. So like the ops team was like, this is so nice. Like it was just like delivering like a, an analytics or uh, like exec ready like data set with the visualizations already prototyped in the tool. And like, we didn't even know he was doing that. He just literally like pushed it into Google Sheets and then did his own thing. Um, One of the sync terms uh, for data into Snowflake or out of Snowflake. Ah, okay. This is a, uh, so you will notice like for, for us as a company, like we do some pretty heavy handed things in part just because we can. Um, so, and Rudderstack is, it's crazy how fast it is because I use like other tools in the past. Um, so the default sync time is 30 minutes, but you can run it actually like as fast as you want. Um, so for some things, we actually sync it like every 15 minutes, um, which again, like is, is a little bit heavy handed, um, you know, for a company of our stage. Um, but you know, like we said, we kind of like to do some things just because we're able to do it. But we do have some, um, that's actually not uncommon, especially like for B2C, right? Yeah. Um, like we have really big, like, you know, you know Priceline or Crate and Barrel or whatever. Um, and for them, like real-time analytics is like every 15 minutes or so, right? Because they're like running all these A-B tests on their website that rely on behavioral data. And so they, you know, it's like running, I mean, the big ones are running, I don't know, like hundreds of A-B tests at the same time. And so they literally dump data into their warehouse like every 15 minutes. And so like as soon as a test hits statistical significance, um, you know, they'll choose the winner, right? And so it's like, it's basically real-time, which is pretty insane. I mean. You know, probably not every company needs to like do like feed the data into the warehouse every 15 minutes, but it's pretty nice. So at some other jobs we do run like on a, you know, on a nightly basis. Yeah. What do you hate about it? What, what do you wish you could do better? Or what, what things are kind of? Oh man, that's a great, great question. Uh, I'll let Ryan say. Well, you so you're like. Yeah, I mean on the tech side a lot more. Yeah. So. That's a great question. There's a couple things. Um, I'd get rid of Salesforce. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's the I, worst. <laughs> um, Don't tell the sales team. <laughs> so one thing, one thing that I, I mentioned, uh, and this is actually, it's kind of a toss-up because this is something that we're working on right now, but one thing I mentioned is that 
I don't have to go into the, the UI at all. You know, as a data engineer, I'm doing everything at instrumentation level, and then I'm pushing code via API to manage the data in flight. Um, the one kind of missing piece of that is that that, that Eric is doing the, in the UI setting up these these various sorts of destinations where Benji's doing the same thing, um, and so I don't really have any visibility in that unless I go sign into the app itself. And so um, being able to manage that as code, like Terraform style, would be really nice. Since that's what we're building right now, is the ability to basically um, deploy, build, connect all of these various sources and destinations in a Terraform uh, provider. And so that way, I, I really don't have to ever go into the UI. So I can I can pull down the Terraform, see what Eric set up, I can make changes to it, push it back up, um, and manage all of that via Terraform. So that's the that's the one thing um, we we pitch it as being you know. A CP or whatever we want to call ourselves for engineers, um, but that's kind of the missing piece right now is that I do have to occasionally go sign in and do things, and just I'd love to not be able to do that. Um, what else do I hate? That's a great question. Um, One thing that is that so there's also like you can probably tell like Ryan and I actually because we do a lot of this we have like a, a really robust relationship with our product team, and so. It is kind of nice because the things we don't like, you know, or like features that are like this would be really nice, we syndicate back to them. One thing that we've been talking with them a lot about is advertising conversions. So we didn't show it in this flow because, you know, we're not really a tool built for marketers, but one really nice thing like as a marketer is that all the like events that are streaming, you know, to, to the stack here, you can basically take existing events that have been instrumented. So for example, like a form submit, um, call that has a property of you know request demo or whatever that Ryan instrumented that's getting like sent to this entire stack, you can actually flag that as a conversion for an ad platform, so an existing event, right? So you don't have to deal with like the nightmare of like okay I'm doing like the Google Ads little thing and then I'm doing the Facebook one and then the Reddit one you know all that sort of stuff, which is really really convenient, right? Because you're like you can just save that whole mess. Um, the thing that we run into that's challenging, and this is something that's interesting, like we talk about like the growth stack and the things that you run into, is like, you know, initially we were, you know, running some Google ads and like doing a little bit of remarketing, right? And now we have like, you know, someone who's really focused on running paid programs and scaling that and looking at cost per lead and like wanting to get conversions back. And the APIs for marketing platforms are so inconsistent in the way they do everything, and so there is actually like some pain on the instrumentation side and we've had to do a couple things that are like really annoying on the instrumentation side to sort of get to like meet the requirements of every ad platform even though Rubberstack like can technically send a conversion. So for example like LinkedIn has like a very specific like JSON format with like this ID or whatever whereas like other platforms are just really easy, right? They're like sort of, you know, you just need to like set one one particular thing, they'll, they'll take the whole payload. So that's one area we're working with the product team to basically um, make it easy, or remove all of the additional instrumentation to sort of manage like the, the inconsistencies across those. Um, so that is that is kind of painful at this point, um, but I think we have line of sight on how to fix that. And then also the other thing that is really nice is as more ad platforms um, sort of roll out server side conversions. We're actually literally just ripping a lot of the like that direct, you know, to sort of like to add platform conversion, like, you know, sort of flowing through with like an event payload. And the pipeline that comes from Snowflake and goes through, we're actually reverse ETLing where we can all of our ad conversions server side, um, which is really nice as well. Because you can include like a lot more data. Uh, in the conversion. Great question. So it seems like what you've done here, you've kind of decoupled the data layer from the app layer, right? Which is a very different way of how traditional customer data platforms have, have built, you know, uh, the products that they're they're selling. What's the advantage of like decoupling that data layer being owned in this case uh, by Snowflake and then the app layer and the kind of um, managing the data flow uh, between the two. What's the advantage of this versus, say, a segment um, in terms of, like, why should companies care about building the infrastructure this way? That's a great question, and I was a really heavy segment user uh, before I started using Rudderstack, and actually before I, I used Rudderstack before I joined the company. 
this is my perspective. So there's, I would say like one thing that's really nice, like Rudderstack doesn't actually store any data, right? So there's like, there's no data being stored here. There's no data being stored here. Like it's just pipelines, right? Everything lives in Snowflake. And of course, you know, we have S3 and a couple of things that, that aren't on this chart for simplicity's sake. But we literally have complete control over the data and, and how it's modeled, how it's shaped, like all that sort of stuff. I mean, Rudderstack dumps it into the warehouse with predefined schemas. But before I talked about like making a change, you know, to sort of like fields or whatever across the stack happens in an underlying table in Snowflake and then it gets pushed out and syndicated to the rest of the stack. And so what's really nice about not, we're, we're not like beholden to, because I've used tons of marketing tools and the reality is they all have their own database, which means they're making decisions about data modeling and data types and other stuff like that, right? You have to, you can't build software without like actually making some of those decisions. But that means that you're kind of beholden to the way that, to the decisions that they've made, right? Which when you're a small company and it's not complex, like that's not a big deal. Um, but when you address some of the things like domain rank or the concept of an account, like we build the concept that fits for our business in Snowflake and then send that out to the stack as opposed to a situation where, like, you know, for example, on the segment personas or something like, it's pretty hard to deal with accounts, right? Because it's really based around individual users, right? And their model of like building a user record, right? Um, so it's super flexible from that regard, right? So we can go to, um, really what we do is we go to the Benji, the guy who's like building all the DVT models. And since all the data is structured, like we can, we can just, do things really quickly, um, sort of to meet the needs of our business, um, which is cool. Ryan, yeah, I mean, the the win there for me is that I I don't know or care what's going on. <laughs> like I've like I've I've been we, I've instrumented this, you know, from the the engineering side, and then those tables, you know, in Snowflake, I I managed some earlier, but now Benji does that, so we have kind of a golden customer record there that fits our business needs. And so like Eric mentioned, customer success yeah. is evaluating Zendesk and Intercom right now. I don't even know that they're, I didn't even know they're doing that because like they're able to basically set up one of those integrations without going through an integration. They can, they can connect it in the dashboard, so that data's flowing instantly, and then they can just sync that full user record over from the warehouse. And Intercom or Zendesk now look like we've been using it for a long time because our customers are in there with the profile and the way that we would want to see it. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, that's attached to it. We have lifetime value. We have, you know, their sign up date. All that stuff just exists. And so they can analyze, they can evaluate both of those tools in line very easily without me being involved at all. So, like, I'm kind of joking, but also it's like, it, it really is that I don't have to, like, get involved with those decisions because we kind of, we have our model, we know what it looks like, and, like, everyone can kind of use it as they need to. Yep. It's pretty fast. I mean, I know we talked about it being fast, but it is really nice to, like, just be able to run it super fast, right? Whereas, like, tools I've used before, it's like three hours, six hours, whatever, right? And so even though we don't necessarily have to have that, it's, that's really nice. I think the other thing actually is like, <coughs> I'm just thinking about a lot of, you know, sort of having a background in marketing, some of the like marketing type customer data platform things that I've used or whatever, like you do segmentation and you try to create value, like all that sort of stuff. And getting that out of those platforms is like extremely difficult, right? Whether that's an audience or whatever. And so to be able to do that all on our own infrastructure is is just super nice. Because um, it's not like, okay, well how do we, like, literally in a lot of cases, like, you will export like a giant flat file of information, <laughs> you know, to sort of like get segmentation or whatever out of a tool, uh, which is horrible. Um, you know, and then also those things get really big, right? And so then you're like, okay, well, great, like I have to call Ryan to like process a giant flat file to like get it somewhere. It's, it's really messy. So those things are just really nice. 